sorry. But uh, then this, this happened. This, this, uh, this pocky clips happened, and that's, it's all finished. It just isn't there anymore. So you got to understand that uh, this is home, and there's no tomorrow land, and well, I ain't Captain Walker. <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Max Minute, where there's no tomorrow Morrowland, but there is Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, one minute at a time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minute 59, which begins with a gaggle of kids yelling at Max, and it ends with a mystical wind rising in the crack in the earth. We are joined once again by our guests who are desperately searching for the land of tomorrow, Sean German and Dave Pallas from the Groundhog Minute podcast. Hey. Thank you. Thank you for having us back on. Yeah. Thank you. Our pleasure. Yeah, it must be nice to not have to wake up to that same Sonny and Cher song. <laughs> yeah, just a gaggle of kids just yelling at us like, I don't know. I just don't know. <laughs> the worst part about all of these kids yelling, and it's great that we're jumping right into it here, is that the people who write the subtitles mm. just give up. <laughs> they don't even try to get all of the shouting. And for my notes, I just put in brackets, indiscernible shouting. And I think that might be one advantage the deaf have over the hearing is that when they get to this scene, they don't have to hear all of just the incessant whining and shouting. And But I was going to Tashi Station to pick up some power converters <laughs> type stuff. It's just awful. Yeah. I think there's something universal, whether it's civilization or you're out in the wasteland, just kids are kids. It's they always want something. There's some new toy. There's, you know, clean water or hygiene or indoor plumbing. There's always something. It's always, you know, take us to Mount Splashmore. Just you know, kids. It's one of those things where you look back on Road Warrior and you're like, wow, it was such a good decision to make the feral kid a mute. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, the perfect kid doesn't talk. He can take care of himself. He can help defend. Yeah. Yeah, that kid's got one of the highest body counts in the movie. And then you got these bums. <laughs> <laughs> so now this movie is PG-13, you said. Were the previous ones rated R? Were they more like just, just good old-fashioned hard edge? 75% of the Mad Max movies are rated okay, R. Okay, okay. Right. <laughs> they were a lot more explicit in the violence. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think was a big part of that that rating, yeah. I was kind of curious. You're, yeah, you're describing this feral kid like... You know, you have this this a child with a with with the hero. You know, first thing that came to my mind was Temple of Doom, and then you know this could be like I'm not saying this is the Last Crusade, but like Last Crusade's a little bit more tame compared to Indy's violence in the previous um, Indiana Jones films. So I was kind of curious they were trying to soften Max up a bit. It's like oh, we surround with kids. He's like you know he's he's thinking about more than just getting fuel and getting out. And you guys have made Rick and Julia. You folks have kind of made that comparison as well to kind of the, the first movie, Mad Max and Raiders is sort of the serious adventure movie. And then the second movie, Temple of Doom and Road Warrior gets a little bit harder and darker and a little more violent. And then they kind of pull back and go the other direction in the third one with Last Crusade and Thunderdome. It's, a, it's still a dark world, but the overall tone is a little bit lighter and there's more, some more humorous moments. I kind of like to look at it in terms of the Star Wars movies where Mad Max, the first one, was a very self-contained story. Max has interactions with characters and by the end, his story is more or less complete, even if he's just riding out into the sunset. Mm -hmm. And then you have the second one, Road Warrior and Empire Strikes Back are often seen as the best out of that original three. And then you've got Beyond Thunderdome and Return of the Jedi. And I think it was... Back in week 10, I want to say, when we were talking to the guys from Minute Impossible, where we were talking about how the kids from the crack in the earth are more or less post-apocalyptic Ewoks. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and Max is their C-3PO. They're that cutesy bit to really help sell the toys to children. 
Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Oh, the 80s when movies were made for adults and marketed to children. Yeah. Oh, man. Like RoboCop. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Speaking of, yeah, speaking of uh, yeah. Van, uh, was it, uh, 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 Paul Vanhoeven, just, yeah, my dad did not understand Starship Troopers. He's like, oh, clearly your you kids want to see a movie, but that movie's just so violent. What's with all this? And uh, yeah, now you like look back at, oh, yeah, same guy did RoboCop. Yep, it's all, it's all checking out. <laughs> So all of these kids shouting, just making all sorts of noise. There is a behind-the-scenes video that we mentioned way early in the podcast that it's been a while since we've watched, but there are scenes that stick out in my mind of George Ogilvie, who was the co-director on this movie, working with this giant group of children for the scene that we were talking about last week and now these scenes here, and Mm -hmm. trying to wrangle so (laughs) many children to all work together, you really understand why Miller was like, you know what, I'll take care of the action scenes. Let me worry about the Thunderdome fight and the car chases and stuff. Ogilvy, you go wrangle these kids. (laughs) Honestly, I don't know which job was harder, but I have a feeling that Miller got the better end of the deal. (laughs) Yeah, I wonder if that second director, you know, he thought, oh, well, this is a bargain. And then George Miller just says, no. (laughs) I mean, it's like they say in Hollywood, never work with animals or children. Yeah. Well, and these, these children are practically animals, so. <laughs> he's, and he's working with a bird hat, too. You know? Yeah. Uh, uh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're children dressed like animals, so it even True. heightens the difficulty, I'm sure, because there's so many things for them to get distracted by. So Max is there. He's trying to get a word in edgewise. And luckily for Max, Slake is there. He turns back to the kids and he yells, listen it, and it quiets down these kids. And thank goodness for that, because otherwise, who knows how long the shouting would have continued. (laughs) Max does do a gesture that I think he's trying to mimic the gesture that Slake gave earlier that immediately quieted the kids down. But it certainly does not work for Max. No, he doesn't quite have the social pull with them. But he is being patient. Like you, as I said, like, I think if... You know, you had the more Tom Hardy right. He would like do like like like, like, huh! like he would like do like do some kind of like scary thing. He'd like he'd be, he'd be loud for a moment that would scare him. <laughs> Whereas at least yeah, the the Mel Gibson portrayal, he's like, look, I this is a rough spot. We're all trying to just trying to figure this out right now together. And I, is he holding a slide? Is he holding a picture of something in his hand? Yeah, he's holding the slides from the Viewmaster that they were using for the presentation oh, last okay, week. Okay. Mm-hmm. When did he get those in his hand? Probably when Slake was pulling them out of the Viewmaster, he was handing them to Max. Yeah. Yeah, like, see, right? Okay. That must have been Yeah, it. it must be like, see, we did this and we did that. And we, you know, he's like hanging as, 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 as like evidence. See, see, we have it all straight. It's all, it's all here. One funny detail about this shot of Slake turning back to the kids and shouting for all of them to listen it. Focus on Savannah, Helen Boudet's character, because she's right behind Slake. And as he turns to shout, her face is right next to his. And he is shouting, listen it, at the top of his lungs. And poor Helen Bidet is like recoiling because he's essentially shouting in her oh, face. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Say it. Don't spray it, buddy. Yeah. yeah. Totally uncomfortable situation. It was, I got a real kick out of it when I saw it. That's funny. But yeah. She, she closes her eyes and kind of takes a step back. And yeah. <laughs> So now that the kids are quiet, Max can get a word in edgewise. (laughs) So he starts off saying that there were places called cities and all the kids cities cities. repeat the word cities. Mm. And he says, now there was lots of them and they had the knowing of a lot of things. They had skyscrapers, they had videos and they had the Sonic. But then and then he motions over to their paint wall. Then this happened. This Pocky Clips happened and it's finished. It just isn't there anymore. And during this explanation from Max, I love watching the reaction of the children because he starts with a lot of his terminology and then slowly transitions into using their verbiage. And so when he starts talking about cities, you watch these kids and they're trying to say the word Mm. cities and it just doesn't have a good mouthfeel for them. So they're contorting their faces to try and repeat the words. Yeah, like cities. Cities. Yeah. Um, What does he mean by the Sonic? Like. I'm like, are we talking about Smash Bros? <laughs> like, because yeah, that could start a war if it was a, a Smash Bros game that went bad. I, I personally, 
I go as Captain Falcon. So, like, I understand the bird and the flight and the strength of one Captain Falcon. So, I understand that. And he drives a car. Heaven forbid that you have two camps within the waiting ones. One is Team Nintendo and one is Team oh, Sega. Oh. <laughs> there might be a pile of bones out back that were the Nintendo crowd. And these are all of the Sega kids who love Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> They skip over that part of the history of the tribe. <laughs> yeah. The console wars were not harmless in Australia. I so many dead toads. <laughs> As I mentioned, he's using these new uh, phrases. He says skyscrapers, which they're really easy to latch onto because they call them high scrapers. Oh. So it's really easy for them to bust them out. And then he talks about video and Sonic. So video, obviously television, movies, moving pictures, and the Sonic, which they refer to the Sonic as, I want to say, recorded audio, music and things like that. Also, it kind of lumps in radio. The idea of electronic sound, okay. or at least not always electronic. It can be analog, too, because they're carrying around a vinyl record and whatnot, but... You get the idea. Mechanically generated sound. Okay. But yeah, once he mentions video and Sonic, they're all smiles. They know exactly what he's talking about. And then he drops the metaphorical bomb as he's talking about the literal bomb, saying, oh yeah, all of these things that you've been dreaming about, that you love, they're gone. Yeah, yeah, it sucks. They think they're there, and that, oh, we just get Captain Walker to get us. We don't know where they are, so if we just get Captain Walker to fly us there, we'll be, we'll, be, we'll be set. And he's like, no, 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 you are safe here. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a... There's a lesson there, sort of life is the thing that happens while you're waiting for the next big thing. Mm. You know, they think mm. there is, there's some place to go. There's a life waiting for them. But no, this, this is where you are. This is your life. The thing you're doing now, it isn't, it isn't something over the horizon. It isn't something that's going to come later. It's, it's the here and now. It's the existence that you're living. Yeah. And when your little tribal religion is based all around the idea of waiting for someone else to show up. There's a lot of living happening elsewhere mm -hmm. that they're just not privy to because they're sitting there waiting for Captain Walker to come save them. Back during the tell a few minutes ago, Savannah says a line that has kind of been bothering me a little bit. She says that Captain Walker said, wait, someone will come for you, more or less. That line from Captain Walker, I think was kind of damaging to them. I think it stunted their growth. They are so obsessed and dutiful about waiting for someone to return to take them home that I think their society, while it has grown and become sustainable and more sophisticated than it started out as probably, could have done better if they weren't so focused on waiting for somebody to come. Do we see that scene? And do we actually get to see that scene in this film? No. Okay. No, we don't. It's just a story. It's, I can't remember at the moment, at the end of Savannah's tell, does she say that Captain Walker said to them before he left, mm -hmm. wait here, somebody will come for you. Yeah. Is that in the Basically, movie? Basically, Captain Walker and the group of 20 that he leads away from the crack in the earth to go find help, they go about as far as they can. And then before they're out of earshot, Captain Walker turns around walks back towards the tribe and shouts out, wait, one of us will come. Mm. And all of the kids join in the chant, wait, one of us will come. And then Captain Walker leaves properly with the rest of the group. And so they keep thinking, either Captain Walker or one of his associates, but I think it's kind of evolved over the years to just be Captain Walker is coming back mm -hmm. and not necessarily an envoy from Captain Walker is going to come back. But it's definitely a key part of their mythology. Yeah. Yeah, and I think him saying that, I think it damaged them. I mean, maybe damage is a strong word. It set them on a path that is less healthy and less productive than if they were just left there to their own devices. It's a path of inaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. He's put them in a holding pattern and they're waiting for a runway to open. And meanwhile, they're just up there burning gas and eventually they're going to reach a point where their airplane is no longer sustainable and it's going to drop out of the sky. Do you mind if I jump around a little bit? Because that leads into a question that I've long had about the end of this movie. Okay. Yeah, go for it. So Captain Walker and the other adults, they leave and they never come back. And then later on in this movie, we see 
a group of these people leave. And eventually they do make their way to a city. And we see that they do repopulate and they start to rebuild in the city. The group that leaves, do they ever come back and pick up the gatherers that have that it, that stayed behind or is it just that group that left originally they go directly to the city and and just leave their comrades behind do they do do they pull a captain walker or do they come back and and pick up the rest of the tribe that's a good question because there's a lot of kids in these scenes in the book it is specified that there are 52 children mm-hmm. Now, I'm not sure there's actually 52 children in the movie, but there's a lot. There's at least, guessing there's at least 30. But there's only a handful that go on the adventure. And then in the very last scene where we see Savannah doing the tell, there's not that many kids sitting there listening to her. Yeah, and, I, and obviously at, at the scene at the end, there, there are more people there, I think, than the small group that goes off on the adventure. But one... People make more people, and although some of the people there are too old to be that, but we know some time has passed, and they also say they've gone up into the high scrapers and they've been lighting fires as Mm -hmm. beacons to other wanderers in the wasteland to help bring people together and build their community. So we don't know exactly, just that there's more people there could be other wanderers that have come in in addition to procreation and whatnot. Um, yeah. I'm looking at the dialogue from Minute 101 where Savannah is doing the bulk of her ending speech. Mm-hmm. And she talks about those of them that had the luck and started the hall for home and that hall led them here. And it more or less sounds like they didn't tell the... (laughs) They just left them there. (laughs) It makes it sound like they didn't tell Jedediah, hey, you need to go pick up our friends. Right. Right. And bring them here as well. Oh, that is... That is dark. They pulled a walker. Yeah. Yeah. They left and just never came back. Well, they're not entirely... They. I don't think... They they didn't say they were coming back the way Walker does. But yeah, they, they just left them there. Right. They were kind of a... Splinter group. Right. So they're just perpetuating the cycle. Yeah. I learned it from you, Captain Walker. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> I learned it from you, Captain. I always assumed that the adults died, and that's why nobody ever came back. But maybe they didn't. Maybe they went off and found lives that they could function, <laughs> and thought maybe they thought it would be better if the kids stayed behind in their crack in the earth. That they would have a better life there rather than out in the world where things are pretty rough. Mm-hmm. They're probably waylaid by raiders or something like that. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I got to assume that they died because I don't. Yeah, I mean, well, because we, you know, we see what Max has seen that this group they're doing pretty well, all things considered. And yeah, they're better off staying where they are versus going to a place like Barter Town. But mm-hmm. that initial group that set out with Captain Walker. They wouldn't know that if they came upon a barter town and said, listen, this is no place for kids. You know, do they but do they know, oh, the kids are fine without us? I would think they'd be worried mm-hmm. that the the kids would die, assuming that they. Well, Max definitely know. sees the crack in the earth as a viable homestead because mm-hmm. he tells them flat out, you know, those cities are not there anymore. Yeah. They were blown up in the poxy clips. So you've got to understand that this, meaning the crack in the earth, is home. Mm-hmm. There's no Tomorrowland, and I ain't Captain Walker. Right. And he drops the metaphorical microphone because if you <laughs> drop a literal microphone, I will throat punch you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and also we'd just be wondering, where the heck did you get that microphone? Uh, well, yeah. But, I mean, if you're in the apocalypse, don't drop any microphones no. because you don't know how many yeah, microphones are Microphones left. <laughs> are hard to come by. I mean, this is really good. This this crack in the earth is, so they're out of the heat. You know, they're out of the sun. They've got water. This is a mm-hmm. pretty good oasis. Oh, yeah. They've got fish to catch. They've got plants to forage. The hunting group, when we first see them, have come back with a boar. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a lot of meat right there. Yeah. Is this so like, I think the, are you saying this crack in the earth has like almost its own ecosystem? More or less. Yeah. It's yeah. on the edge of a giant desert. No one crosses the desert, so no one comes to bother them. Wow. They've got this nice little area that they can live in. Yeah. And Max sees it as foolishness to leave. Right. Is basically what we're getting yeah. at. Yeah, the, the real danger is not well, so there, there is a danger of if these children or, you know, of a group or one of these people heads out and makes it makes their way to Barter Town, what will happen to them there? That's one danger. 
The greater danger is a small group heads out, goes to Barter Town, and someone in Barter Town figures out, oh, there's this place out in the desert. The, these people came from somewhere and decides to go look for them. If they get found and someone from Barter Town realizes, oh, this is a place, it's got water, it's got food, it's got, you know, it's, it's sheltered from the sun and the weather, and I don't have to answer to Auntie or Master Blaster, then this place is going to be overrun. That's that's mm. the real danger. It, a good that point. someone goes to Barter Town and then Barter Town comes back to look for them. Yeah. I'd never thought of that before, but that could be a problem. My first inclination is to say, well, there's enough room and enough water for everybody. I mean, the area has to be larger than just their little cove. But on the other hand... I- that area can only sustain so many people. Mm -hmm. And if you bring a bunch of corrupted adults into this area, it's going to destroy this relatively pure society that innocent children have created. It's going to wreck the whole thing. Yeah. The easiest way now from what you just said, Sean, that I can, I can like compare it to is if you play on a multiplayer survival game server uh, whether it be like a Minecraft server where you can build stuff and you can mine the earth or like games like Rust which is very close to this where it's it's apocalyptic and you can you have stone you know you go from stone to iron to more technological advances one of the things about those games is you're playing with people online and you want to have a good home and a good safety and you don't want anybody in because you know you don't you don't you don't know if you trust them and you know um that's happened a couple times you play one of these games and you pissed off the wrong person somewhere while you were hunting or foraging they follow you home i've done it i've done it i followed a guy home so where (laughs) where it is because i was like because i wanted to know where he was i was going to attack him but i wanted to know where he was so i knew i'm not going to go that way and I'm not going to try to run into that guy. And it, I mean, it didn't matter. Eventually, a posse will eventually come and, you know, they'll attack your place. So, you know, that's the easiest way to describe it. if you ever play uh, any of the online video games. Like, that's survival games. It's like your home and where you forge all your stuff is so important that to lose such a beautiful area like this crack in the earth to, to raid or to, to some griefer would suck. And that's what you're telling me is that these these Barter Town Thunderdome characters uh, would immediately just um, enslave and just gore this whole place out for their own uh, their own selfish needs. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I think they would. I wouldn't give them a second thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Spot on, Dave. Yeah, it's ch- a bunch of children. Oh, we can handle that. And next thing you know, it's, yeah. Max does not have any kind words about Barter Town. We're not going to hear them next week. We have to wait until the week afterwards. Next week is going to be a lot of staring at things <laughs> and quiet contemplation minutes. Like I said, it's, it's going to be something else, but <laughs> that's down the way. Anyway. So back to the minute. Max is standing there. He just dropped that mm-hmm. bomb on them saying, I'm not Captain Walker. And he's holding this hat and he flings he it up in the it away. Air. Now we've already seen in this movie. Well, everyone except Dave has seen in this movie <laughs> that Max has the uncanny ability of throwing things. Oh, really? <laughs> when he was auditioning with Auntie before he went into Underworld, found Master Blaster, went into the Thunderdome, fought him. The audition involved a room full of guards versus Max. And one of the first things that Max did is he reached down, grabbed a platter, and threw that platter like a flying disc straight into one guy's chest or throat or whatever. Either way, it knocked him down, and then the fight commenced. Mm. So Max based on that evidence, has an uncanny ability to throw things. So as he throws this hat into the air, not only is it a great throw to begin with, but something that Max could not have planned for, in the middle of throwing that hat, the wind picks up and catches that hat and just makes it fly straight up into the air. (laughs) I don't know if you want to call this good luck or bad luck. I guess it depends on how you want the outcome of this situation to be, but it is what it is. (laughs) For Max, it's certainly bad luck. He just finished explaining as bluntly and as gently as he could that everything that they have been waiting for and everything that they have hoped for is dead and gone and they need to come to terms with that and that he is not who they think he is. He just finished this whole thing and then he performs this miracle. (laughs) And all of these kids, they're looking up in amazement. They think that Max is an airbender. (laughs) They yes, think he controls yeah. the hey, I wind. thought that for a minute, I'm like, oh my God, is that hat magic? Is that, is that bird alive? Like, whoa. Even I was impressed. I really feel for Max because 
this just kind of screws him over a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they've completely forgotten everything he just said. But though I think even Max feels the moment that there's something, something unusual is happening here, that even Max has to admit <laughs> it. Yeah. As the wind is whipping through this area, like everyone is caught off guard. We get a shot of the waiting ones looking up at the hat flying in the air. We get a shot of Screwloose sitting up on his ledge and all of his trinkets and whatnot are getting blown over by the wind. And we push through the crowd of children and we're looking at Max and he's looking up around. He'd be like, where did this wind come from? What is going on? What have I just found myself (laughs) in? My situation has not improved. Yeah. (laughs) There is something that I have a question about. When we're up in Screwloose's grotto, we see the bones of, I assume, people, members of the group who have passed. Mm -hmm. There's also a painting on the wall of Screwloose's face. I'm wondering, is that Screwloose's depiction of himself or is that Screwloose's depiction of somebody else who he then models himself after? Yeah, the first thing I had when I saw the Screwloose character and that painting was, I was like, oh, is this some kind of proto-war boy? Like, I didn't know who Screwloose was. So I was like, wow, he's got the face paint. He's got the sunken eyes. I mean, this guy looks like, he looks really close to what the, the war boys were in Fury Road. So yeah, like, I was kind of, I was curious now, like, w- was George trying to hint at something when he showed the war boys in the later films, like, at, at that 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 aesthetic somehow carried over. Sean, what do you think? I do think this is this is someone else. And uh, it actually never occurred to me that, that this is a, a sort of a look that he patterned himself off of. And that's why there's similarity. But it just didn't make sense of why would you have this or I just didn't think he was, you know, that much of an ego to have sort of an altar to himself that's with true. his own that, picture. That would be so weird. I always assumed it was someone else. <laughs> yeah, but, you know. He does well, have a screw loose. That could be that could be like that could be a language thing though. Since he's not writing this is the home of screw loose. This just could be his way of saying like of, of identification, you know? Like this is like the sign of saying like if you come here, this is this is my home. Yeah. I always saw it as that sort of situation where he's not so much hanging a sign on his door to his bedroom saying screw loose's room no girls allowed. He's saying <laughs> This is my picture of myself on this sign. I'm going to lean it against the wall so everybody knows that this bone-filled grotto is my bone-filled grotto. Right. And Mm -hmm. think about your own home. Do you have pictures of yourself around your own home? Most people do. Yeah. They're usually paired with loved ones. Mm -hmm. That reminds me. uh, The movie While You Were Sleeping, Mm -hmm. Lucy is going through her boyfriend, not boyfriend, his, his wallet. He's... In a coma. He's the one who was sleeping. And it's played by Peter Gallagher. She's going through his wallet. They're all single pictures of himself. Really? Doing things. Going Ooh. skiing and surfing and, you know, having all these fun times. But they're all by himself. And she goes to his apartment. Same thing. There's pictures all over the place, but they're just of himself. And it's weird. Yeah. And it's a sign of his conceit. That is weird. Who does she end up getting together with? The brother. Is it Dylan McDermott or Dermot Mulroney? It's neither one. What? It's Bill Pullman. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, right. Bill Pullman. Yeah, right? Good for Wait, him. Is, is Bill that- Pullman? Wait, hold on. The is that the, is that the, the one from Alien or the president from Independence Day? President from Independence Day. Okay. Independence Day. For some reason, I <laughs> thought it was Dermot Mulroney. <laughs> you know, you love that movie. You. I have seen that movie. So... Two different levels of appreciation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, my mom rented that from Blockbuster a long time ago. I have very, very small memories it's of it. It's a very funny movie. Okay, I will give you, it is a romantic comedy. So I understand that it just isn't your type of movie, necessarily. <laughs> but aside from that, it is a very funny movie. <laughs> My mom and I would have alternating weeks of of who would rent the movie. So <laughs> so she would rent that and then like I would rent the shadow and then like you know she would rent that and I'd be like I'm going to rent the Goonies for the 10th time. And like it got to the point where I rented the Goonies so many times my dad's like all right I'll buy the VHS. <laughs> She's like, I don't want to watch Goonies. Would you hear? Here's just Goonies. You can watch it whenever you want now. Well, it is the Goonies. Yeah. I was like, because as I said, I look around and go, I don't know. I'm looking at all these movies with kids. I, I'm sure I go Goonies again. I was trying to find the next Goonies. It's like, 
Ah, okay, and that's the Goonies. <laughs> I just remember that being like, he was in a coma the whole time. I don't get it. My mom's like, well, that's the point of the movie. I'm like, yeah, he didn't get to say anything. Like, I was a kid. Like, I don't, I don't get the whole <laughs> You don't thing. want him to it. say anything. He's a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there is a remake coming to theaters of Overboard, which mm. is about, I think it's oh. Anna Ferris, <laughs> and there's like a rich guy on a yacht. He goes overboard, gets amnesia, and then she tries to like slide into his life as his fiance or something mm-hmm. like that. It sounds very much while you were sleeping, but I'm pretty sure that the Overboard that's coming out as a remake is gender-swapped remake because yes. the original was Rich Lady Falls Off a Boat yeah. and then the guy takes advantage of her amnesia. So this new Anna Ferris movie is a combination of Overboard and While You Were Sleeping. I think so. Okay. I still don't want to see it. No. Yeah, Whatever. it's got 28% <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes, yeah. two out of yeah. four Rolling Stones, five on IMDb. I just said, you know, it was box office, let's see, man, 40, 49 million. Oh, it already I came mean, it made out? some money back because its budget was under 12. And so, uh, apparently, I don't know the guy, but yeah, his name is uh, U- uh, Eugenio Derbez. I think apparently he's a, he's a popular guy. Hmm. So maybe in international markets, it made a good uh, amount of money. But uh, yeah, it's it's, a, it's it's in theaters now if you really want to see huh. it. I didn't realize Go it was ahead. in theaters now as we're recording it. I thought it was uh, still yeah, coming. It came out thing. beginning of the month. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a double feature tomorrow between Solo and the new Overboard movie. Let's not. Let's there you go. <laughs> Let's not. <laughs> What's the light behind Max at the end of the minute? Is that always been there? Is that like a is that the projector? So this light behind Max is new. Okay. It was definitely not there before. I kind of see it as the same thing earlier in the movie and Dave, you didn't get to see this because you haven't watched the whole thing yet. But there's another instance where a character is walking towards the camera mm-hmm. and they're backlit by a giant light, but it's in the middle of the desert where there would not be a giant light there. I mm-hmm. think that just might be one of those magical qualities of the waiting ones. Okay. Is that whenever something dramatic or significant happens, they're backlit in a way <laughs> very similar to this. So <laughs> we got movie sign, we got magic light. <laughs> Well, I think we can explain it by this is just one of their fires, and then it's getting stoked by the wind. Oh, which is why you're getting more oh, light. That's a good and, idea. And you're also you're getting dust and smoke that's getting kicked up, so you can see. You know, makes the rays a little. You know, give something for the rays to reflect off of, makes it a little more dramatic. But that's uh, nice. That's yeah. smart. You're a smart there guy. You go. So as Max is looking confused at all of this windiness and everyone's amazement of the situation, we're going to put a pin in this. We're going to come back on Friday. The wind is going to continue to pick up. Things are going to happen. The kids are going to rile themselves into a frenzy. They will just go all out. There'll be no stopping them. So get ready for a kid stampede on Friday because that's what we got in store. The Mad Max Minute Podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. The Mad Max franchise was created by George Miller and Byron Kennedy, is presented by Kennedy Miller Mitchell Productions, and distributed by Warner Brothers. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Ire by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. And our outro music is We Don't Need Another Hero by MilitiaVox of MilitiaVox.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Mad Max Minute, like us on Facebook by searching for Mad Max Minute, and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit MadMaxMinute.com where you can check out our Tee Public storefront by clicking the store link join our patreon by clicking the support link or make a one-time donation by clicking the donate link thank you for joining us for minute 59 of beyond thunderdome we'll see you next time